Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Telly Whitney, President and CEO of the Anita Borg Institute. Telly's generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Telly, for joining us today. Delighted to be here. So the Anita Borg Institute, as, a, as an organization dedicated to advancing the interests of women in technology, mm -hmm. holds a very fascinating place, particularly at this moment in time and in this place in San Francisco and globally, mm -hmm. given the challenges that corporations face in driving innovation and engaging all the talents that human beings have to offer in doing so. Mm -hmm. Talk about how the Anita Borg Institute came to be. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really important. I mean, it's really important that women are at the table creating technology. They're half of the population. Technology innovation is, will, 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 will really determine the rest of our lives and generations to come. And so to have women at the table creating technology is really important. And just deciding on what problems need to be solved. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so we were formed in 1997 by Dr. Anita Borg, but our programs actually date back to 1987 when she created something called Sisters, which at that time there just were not many women in the computing discipline. And so it was a chance to, co together, to come together online and talk about what it means to be both a computer scientist and also a woman. And many women who were involved in the engineering fields were also involved in a way that diminished their contribution and their role and recognition thereof. Mm -hmm. So you had people who were actually central to the solving of these massive engineering problems, yet they, since they did not gain prominence, they couldn't affect the field in the way they should have affected the field. That's right. And um, what happened is, is that there were a few women, um, women like Grace Hopper, who found a way to, to, to really make contributions and for her contributions to be more known. But there were many women who contributed to the computing and engineering discipline I mean, when I first got into computing, for example, my first teacher was a woman, and there were women graduate students. In fact, at the time, because computing was not so well formed, it wasn't necessarily thought of as an engineering discipline, there were more women. There was a very senior woman at my first job at Spirit Univac. So it was as it became known as an engineering discipline that it took on many of those characteristics that you started to see less women participate. Do you feel that, that the way our economy works, that, that you have kind of the systematic squeezing out of certain types of talent, certain attributes uh, from the workforce, from the leadership ranks, um, and, and, that, and that there needs to be a rebalancing and a discussion about that because it really does affect which products are being developed, which features are being uh, implemented, which um, which um, um, opportunities are afforded to people? Yes, I mean, we often talk about it as the pipeline. There is first and foremost needs to be a supply of women, of women technologists. And that and starts with girls. And that starts with girls, certainly. I mean, right now, about 18% of computer science graduates are women, and about 18% of engineering graduates are women. So first, you need to attract them. And they look around, and it does not look like an interesting discipline. That's starting to change, um, but that's the first place that you need to start. But then, as you said, you want them to come to these companies. And we work with many companies that are looking at key ways to re recruit, retain, and advance women technologists. Um, but quite often, they focus on the recruitment. So that's bringing in more women at the entry level without thinking about what it takes to retain and create positions of leadership for, for more women. The other thing that's very interesting is that the more women that you have in leadership roles, the more that that attracts more women at the entry level. What I also think is, is, is interesting is the, um, the, the effect of the unconscious and the unconscious behavior and the unconscious evaluation of behavior and how that unconscious um, act can affect real outcomes. So when you have people around a table um, looking to hire, mm -hmm. 
very often those people will hire people who act and look and relate like they do. So if you have a lot of men around the table, it's perfectly understandable that they would uh, feel more comfortable with people who look and behave like they do mm -hmm. and talk about the same kind of things. It's not a conscious thing. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you counter that without becoming artificial? So there's actually some very well-known ways and very effective ways to change your recruitment practices, but you have to be conscious. So first of all, you need to go to where the women are. So for example, we have something called the Grace Hopper Celebration, and many companies come there to recruit. But we're not the only place. There are other places to go where to first attract the women. But then you also need to look at your job descriptions. We see that many companies, without, unconsci unconsciously, as you're saying, put very gendered language into their job descriptions. There are also other things that you can do. Look at your interview team. Make sure that that is balanced, not just for women, but for a diverse set of people, especially for more significant um, positions. And then last but not least is to look at your candidate pool. Make sure that you have uh, at least one very qualified female candidate for any significant position. I think there are also questions of, of how do you set up a, a business culture and workflows to solve problems. I think that there are ways in which you can set up reporting relationships and communication structures that, that seem to be more in line with um, the style of thinking that, that men have and the style of behaving that men have, and that there are other ways of solving those same problems that have a different impact. And, and in a sense, by asking men to fit into a, a particular um, structure, or women to fit in a particular structure, you start off by tilting. You, you, you create a structure that women won't like that much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about changing the culture of some of these organizations. And the first thing you need to understand is the culture and that the, and that the ways in which you communicate, the ways that you talk about the work that you do can be very biased. And, most, most people and most companies don't like to think of themselves as biased, but we're all biased. And so looking at your biases and, th and looking at, for example, the way that you're communicating. I mean, one simple example is in meetings, there are some people who actively participate in the meaning dynamics. And dominate, they assert dominate, themselves, yes, talk um, over. Yes, um, and that's more commonly men. Um, and then there's some people who can make real contributions who tend to be quiet. And so the meeting leader, ensuring that everybody fully participates in the meeting content, can do a lot in terms of improving the effectiveness of the meeting, but also affecting the culture of the organization. So this is not just a matter of, of justice or doing what is right. It's also a matter of doing what is profitable. Describe why it's important that mostly men are not designing our products, mostly men are not designing our software, mostly men are not you know, engineering uh, roads and, and figuring out um, how uh, space exploration uh, functions. Why is that important? Well, the, first of all, the reason why companies work with us is because it's a business imperative is not because it's of social justice. I think social justice is important. But they understand that this is key and fundamental to their business. If you take a step back and you look at who your customers are. Who's buying? Who's buying what you, what, what you are producing. It's obvious that your product teams should mirror your customers. Um, IBM, when they revamped a lot of the, their workforce issues a number of years ago, it was really all about business, and it was looking at who their customers were, and they wanted to mirror those customers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there's a lot of social science that shows that innovation is more fundamental and longer lasting if you have a diverse team. I mean, diverse will cost a lot of different axes, but certainly including women. And it simply makes sense that if we all think alike, then the kinds of solutions that we create together 
are not going to be as diverse and thus less interesting. And there's a practical issue as well. Rare talent, by definition, is rare talent. And if you basically cut off um, you know, half of your talent pool and now you're saying, okay, it's rare talent, but it needs to be in that bucket. Mm -hmm. What about all the rare talent in this bucket? Right. I mean, women are 50% of the population. It simply doesn't make sense. Some of the real gems, the people who could change your, your life in terms of your product launches would be women. So talk about how you have your impact, your positive impact on the field. So the Anita Borg Institute works with influencers, they work with women technologists, and they work with organizations. We connect, we ins provide inspiration, and we provide guidance. It makes sense that for women, who often leave at twice the rate of men, that the chance to get to connect with other women helps them stay engaged. And just like with companies that have women at the top, that that attracts more women, providing inspiration to young women can really change their lives in terms of choosing a technology career. Telly Whitney of the uh, Anita Borg Institute, thank you so much for helping us to change, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.